So let me summarize that by saying we have a physical economy. I view that as happening above the ground, so to speak. And then, vum, you can take something in to digital space, bump it around, and then shoot it back up. This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens, with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community-oriented. Our guest today is Brian Arthur, a storied economist and complexity thinker. He is a pioneer in a number of disciplines, including increasing returns, complexity economics, and the evolution of technology. Brian previously served on the Science Board and the Board of Trustees of Santa Fe Institute and is currently an external professor at Santa Fe Institute and a visiting researcher at Park Intelligence Systems Lab. He is one of the youngest endowed shareholders at Stanford University. Brian is also the author of The Nature of Technology, What It Is and How It Evolves. Our conversation with Brian centers on technology and its manifestation within economic systems. More specifically, we cover the nature and evolution of technology, the role of software in shaping economic systems, the concept of increasing returns, and Star Wars as a representation of the human condition. Welcome, Dr. Arthur. We are delighted to have you here. We've read a lot about the work you've done to define technology. It has been really inspiring to read how you think about technology. What sparked your interest in studying the principles of technology, the nature of technology and such? When I went to university, I studied engineering. I was trained as an engineer. And I'm sure if you have a similar background to mine, you realize that all you needed to do was to be good at math. I had no idea what engineering was about. I did very well on the program. Maybe I came top of the class, something like that. And, but I had no idea what a real engineering was about. And I started to get curious, just from a practical point of view, what was technology, what was engineering? How did that, all that work and why was there so little written about it? And I began to realize uh, some major things that in terms of understanding how technology came into being and how it evolved over time, we were where biology was somewhere around 1790. By the time of Darwin's grandfather, we understood a lot People in those days understood a lot about animals, they understood a lot about zoology, anatomy, but nobody at that time seemed to have any detailed knowledge of where species, how species had arisen, which that was the main question that Darwin set out to answer. Not so much evolution, but really where did species come from, novel species? How were animals uh, related to each other? This was quite telling. I realized that we didn't really get good answers in zoology or biology until biologists went inside animals and started to open them up. So a whale doesn't look very much like a hippopotamus. And yet when you start to look at the bone structure, 
and look at how it's put together, skeleton, the anatomy, you begin to realize that there is uh, some sort of close connection. I thought it was very similar in technology. When I launched myself into economics, we talked endlessly about technology, new technologies. But I was struck that with very few exceptions in economics, nobody ever looked inside technologies. I remember being at a seminar in Stanford on modems when they were fairly new in the 1980s. Nobody asked how modem worked or brought one to look at or took one to pieces. I realized that with technology, there's were huge questions unanswered. What is technology? How does it evolve if it does indeed evolve? Do technologies have lines of descent like species and zoology? Where do they come from? How do they originate novel technologies? None of these had a very satisfactory answer. I, I won't say I took on a huge project to, to answer all those questions. It was more, I just got curious. <laughs> I realized that uh, most of what I understood about engineering and technology was theoretical and mathematical. I wanted really, after many decades, to try to go back and figure out how technology worked and what it was. I adopted what turned out to be, I think, a successful technique. Rather than try to argue theoretically, I decided I'd spend two or three years on the good actual technologies. So I picked a dozen or 20 or two dozen technologies to know very well, including spark radio, continuous wave radio, the computer, these are electrical ones railroads, railroad engineering, even penicillin. There's a therapeutical type of technology. I thought I'd spend a year or two studying these up so I knew case studies. I knew what I was talking about. Jet engines were a huge thing I read and read about. And I went to science museums, technology museums in London and Paris, everywhere else I could, and nosed around. That was extremely interesting. I thought to write uh, on this area, I thought I'd have to spend a year or two reading up about technologies and really understanding them. As it happened, it was more like 12 years. I already had four years of engineering, but to gain the sort of knowledge I wanted took me at least a decade or more. After a while, I began to see common patterns and I was able to to my satisfaction to answer questions I'd started out with. Before we go into sort of that, the nuts and bolts, what's your sentiment around why it's important to understand technology? That's a good question. By the way, in that former question, not so much had been thought fundamentally about technology. There's a fabulous engineer I had lunch with quite a while ago. He was then in his 90s, Walter Vincenti. He was an aeronautical engineer here at Stanford, and he a superb engineer. And I asked him just point blank why of engineers not thought much about technology, the fundamentals of technology and where it comes from. And he looked blank. Finally, he scratched his head and he said, engineers like problems they can solve. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I thought it was a, a beautiful answer. It was really true. So in many ways, I felt when I was looking at technology, a lot of it was virgin territory. And a lot of people kept asking me, saying, you know, what are you, you're doing a book. Uh, what's the book on, I'd say, technology. And then there'd be a puzzled look and people would say, why? We tend to take technology for granted. When I say technology, I'm thinking of everything from aircraft, jet engines, military technology, computers, algorithms. I'm not talking about little devices you hold in your hand. That is technology, but that's just a very recent addition to technology. I'm really talking about chemical engineering large electricity supply networks, oil refining, 
these are all technologies. We take them for granted. Why should that be important at all? My first comment on that is I don't think anything really needs to be important. I was just curious about how we got all this, these technologies, but there is some importance to it. And I have a kind of allegory in the book that suppose you woke up one morning and you discovered that all the technology that had been invented say, since 1300 was no longer with you. So you, you walk into your bathroom and there's no toilets, <laughs> there's no coffee machine, try to get to work, there's no car, there's no roads, there's no high-rise buildings, there's no offices, there's just about nothing. And you can say we might have coarse linens and we might have some cathedrals. So it's not trivial, but really it's technology that shapes our lives. It's technology that brings us an economy in the first place. I was taught very much that the economy produces technologies, maybe it does. I'm not denying that it's technologies that produce the economy. The difference between the economy of, say, 30,000 years ago, when we might have been trading sheepskins for obsidian or flint or something, and now is that we have a very sophisticated economy. I'd include within technologies, medical procedures and operations, pharmaceuticals, these are all technologies, and they really make our life what it is. So it's more than anything else, more than ideas, more than lofty ideas like democracy or freedom or anything. We owe our standard of living to technologies. If we didn't have a modern set of technologies, we by and large would not live to see our grandchildren. We will, on average, maybe die in our 30s or 40s. So it's technology that's given us this lifestyle we have, for better or worse, I should add. I'm not in favor of all technologies by any means. But isn't that just so interesting how, relative to its impact on our existence as a human species, it's so little understood by broader public? Yeah, there's been um, a lack of curiosity. We tend to revere and honor science and vaguely. And somebody is put on the moon in 1969 and journalists tell us, isn't science wonderful? But I'm, actually that was 95% engineering, some mathematics and practically very little science that hadn't been known for two or three centuries. So yeah, it is an odd thing we use technology we swim in that. It's like water for fish. We tend not to stop and look at technology, but more than anything, that's what we have. I also think that technology, because it deals with things like roads or shipping oil or container shipping, for that matter, doesn't appear to be mysterious and glamorous, and it's become somewhat orphaned in what we study. It's supposed to be legitimate that we study species in zoology or molecular biology. We study algorithms, we have mathematics. But by and large, beyond a few small exceptions, we take technology for granted. I don't think we study it anywhere near as much as we should. We do know, and I want to be careful with what I'm saying here, we do know a huge amount about individual technologies because we invented them. If you have a new computer, a new Apple laptop, we know exactly how that works. Some engineers know all the details. There's always someone who uh, understands all of that. But by and large, as an intellectual endeavor, technology has been somewhat orphaned. I often compare this to music. Um, if you take all the music that's ever in the canon that's uh, taken up by symphony orchestras, yeah, we have a record of every single phrase or note that gets played by multiple instruments. 
in any symphony. But the, the overall question of what is music, what makes music musical, is much more abstract. People are curious about that. So, yeah, we know quite a lot about individual technologies, at least engineers do. This is a great segue into the work you've done on defining technology. How would you define technology? How have you defined technology? I find that a very tricky issue. and I'm not the first to attempt to define technology, but I wanted a good working definition that I could use. And I discovered that there are three different definitions that make sense. One is that the technology quite simply is a means to a purpose, or maybe a means to many purposes. The computer I'm talking to or the screen, multiple purposes, obviously. But a technology such as high-rise crane has a purpose. It's well-defined. It may vary from time to time. And the other definition at the other end of the spectrum is we talk about technology as the whole collection of technologies. What is technology doing to the planet? So we're talking about the whole collection of technologies. I would have thought when I started there might be a few thousand of those, <laughs> but I investigated one time how many surgical procedures there were that were listed separately as being separate entities, and apparently there's was roughly 64,000 surgical procedures. So if you were to have an old-fashioned phone book listing all the technologies that are well-defined, you'd find there's huge numbers. So that's technology. Kevin Kelly, I think, had a word for that, technioma, technology as a whole. I was a bit slow to realize this, but in between there's a, a kind of use of a, a type of technology. So we talk about railroad technology. We talk about electronics as a technology. We talk about digital technologies. And these are basically whole collections of technologies that we can draw from to carry out some particular purpose. My question to you is, what is not technology? Where do you draw that line? And is it a gray one or a black and white? That's probably a pretty gray one. I remember somebody in the lecture saying, <laughs> my two-year-old pulls tantrums every so often. She's small and she starts to scream and kick her feet on the ground. That's a means to a purpose. Yeah, it depends. There are things on the border. We tend to think of technologies as being objects that we can hit. But I would say an algorithm is very much a technology. It's a means to a purpose. It's a method for doing things. I also had, this was a lot of fun in working with this book, I thought. There are plenty of means to purposes that aren't recognizable as technologies. If an old-fashioned tractor came down the street in a rural town in 1920, you might say that's a technology. But I began to think was well, the Mahler Symphony a technology. If you're Gustav Mahler, you might think I'm trying to bring about certain emotional reactions in people's brains. So this is a means to a purpose. In that sense, then it is a technology. If you're the theater owner, you might say, I'm trying to fill seats and make profits from this, from the concert. I decided I wouldn't try to split hairs too much. But because it turns out that any means to a purpose has certain properties that I find very useful in putting together an argument. So does purpose spontaneously exist in nature? If purpose is required for a technology to exist, is gravity a technology or does technology exist without some cognitive function that has, I guess, a purpose? Curious to hear to what extent cognition is the requirement for technology to exist. It depends. Some or other simple creatures that burrow may have ways or means of burrowing, say, at the 
insect level, and you could debate are they conscious or not. That wasn't the sort of argument I wanted to get into. Let me make a, a different distinction. Gravity is a phenomenon as far as we're concerned here on Earth. It's a phenomenon everywhere as far as we know. There are other phenomena that are just natural phenomena. Lightning happens, forests may go on fire, and so on. Now, if you use fire, possibly to smelt metals, that phenomenon gets used and it becomes a technology. If you use gravity for some purpose, that's used in lowering buckets into wells and things like that, then that's, the well becomes a purpose. So I started to notice that every technology uses at least one phenomenon or maybe several. And like a hammer is using the, ph the phenomenon that some fairly solid weighty object achieves momentum that can be transferred to something else, a useful a nail maybe, or pounding metal, and can thereby alter the metal. So I began to notice that all technologies are using at least one phenomenal, mostly sophisticated ones are simultaneously using dozens of phenomena, if you think of something as sophisticated as a jet engine or a fancy modern electronic circuit. In that sense, technologies, a jet engine is like an orchestration of different phenomena that are being switched in and out. Fuel burns, that causes combustion, that gives energy. That energy as a phenomenon can be used in gases to turn a turbine, which again is using phenomena, which can be used via a shaft to turn a compressor at the front of the engine and so on. So any realistic technology is using multiple phenomena. And then in terms of software, how do you define software? Software is very much using logical phenomena. I, I would, if you go as far as saying that logic and mathematics are natural, have natural phenomena, you can think of A minus B equals something or other, then you can build machines and instruct them to carry out that logic. So again, you'll find that some technologies are built to carry out or realize or make real um, log expressions and logical phenomena. Algorithms interest me enormously. They're basically ways of saying we're asking this to happen and that to happen. An algorithm, for example, a sorting algorithm is basically saying a few put in one end of the sausage machine a lot of different things that can be ranked, say a number or alphabetically, we are giving you back a method that will cause them to be alphabetically or numerically. But all of these were conundrums that had to be thought through, but I don't want to get too hung up in definitions. What really interested me in fact, the key thing is that technologies are built out of other technologies. Novel technologies are built out of parts. Parts or assemblies are built out of other parts and so on. I began to notice everywhere I looked. If you look at a hydroelectric dam site, then that's built out of things like some sort of dam wall to build up water energy behind that. There might be intake pipes, so that's another part. We know how to do piping. Water at high velocity is fed into a turbine. That's another part. The turbine turns and creates, generates electricity. That's yet another object. There's a tail race. There's water coming out, the, the bottom end and so on. Nearly a, a, every technology you look at that isn't just one unit, say like a rivet, is built up of multiple technologies. And those technologies, by and large, existed before we thought of that particular technology. So what really is the 
at the center of any new technology is put together via existing technologies. We want to get a man on the moon that's a sequential, stepwise solution to a problem. We solve that in various stages. We say, so okay, we need a rocket. That rocket's going to have many components itself. There will be many stages. We launch the rocket, we get it into orbit, we put it on a trajectory to the moon, then it goes into some orbit around the moon, we have a landing vehicle and so on. So any realistic technology, almost by definition, consists of assemblies, modules and so on, and they already exist. So novel technologies aren't put together from fabulous light bulb ideas yeah. that I've ever seen. They're put together actually more like saying, okay, I have a whole Lego set of technologies here. I want to create some new purpose. What pieces will I fish out of my Lego set to solve the problem? I've got a, I've got a favorite metaphor here. People tend to think that creating something like the polymerase chain reaction PCR which copies rapidly DNA, that's incredibly sophisticated, and so it is, and we can't really understand it. And the person who invented that, in this case, Carrie Mullis in California, I should add, must have been quite a genius. And yeah, I wouldn't deny that's very important and quite sophisticated. But the process is similar if you had a standard problem. You wake up one morning and you want to get, you work in San Francisco, you live in Palo Alto, you wake up one morning and you say, oh my God, my car is in the repair shop. How am I going to get to work? That's just a problem. But you find you start to put pieces together. If I can get to the train station, I can take Caltrain. I can get from there. Uh, to San Francisco, maybe from there I can get an Uber or whatever people want to on the other side. Then you say, well, how do I get to the station? Possibly my wife can drive me or a friend. What you're doing is you're putting together pieces to answer some human purpose. I want to get to work. There are many ways to do that. What you find is invention is very much what do I have in my toolbox that I can put together to solve this problem? But going back to the theme of software, how do you conceptually situate software in comparison to technology? There isn't a comparison with technology. Software is technology. I started to study, and this is quite a long time ago, in the early 90s, I was learning C. You probably learned and forgotten that, or maybe it's a long time ago, programming language C. And I began to notice that computer programs, applications, whatever you want to call them, were means to purposes. You put together smaller components and you can do something useful with that. Different parts of the program might call in subroutines, switch things on and off. And if you can think of that conceptually, just you can think of a jet engine conceptually, or you can think of it in terms of being implemented on hardware. Software or algorithms are very much created by putting other pieces of software together, generally from programming libraries, or just lifting things out of one application and modifying them a bit and putting them in another application. I guess conceptually situating software, which is an instantiation of technology versus let's say a railroad. Well, Those are different types of technologies. They have different properties. How to think about that aspect of situating software as a type of technology within the broader family of many other technologies that exist. If you look at the design of a railway, really any sort of complicated railway track or something, you'll find that there are pieces that are put together. They are programmed, so to speak, to move logically 
from one thing to trigger another. If a train goes through, maybe a track is changed and so on. If you concentrate on the hardware, you just see hardware, there's rails and so on. But if you concentrate on that technology in use, it becomes a logical sequence of things happening. Now, we can use logical sequences of things happening with some piece of hardware, call it a computer, to emulate or simulate or carry out some function. Train is moving passengers or freight, so it would be freight uh, shipping connection. An algorithm is doing something the same, but it's done in extraordinarily fast inside some machine. You can think of the train conceptually and what triggers what. You can think of an algorithm as what switches what on, what logic lies behind it. But if you're actually carrying out the algorithm, there's a purpose to doing that. There's an awful lot of possibly electrons or whatever you're using to carry out these things inhibiting and calling other subroutines or algorithms. I don't want to get into the weeds as to what's, is this properly a technology or what that is. Uh, what fascinates me is that all those things have properties in common. Three properties are that any technology is using some sort of a natural or logical phenomenon and usually whole families of phenomena. Any technology, if any, that's not trivial, is, has many components that are often switched in and out, whether it's a railway train or a locomotive or whether it's a whole railway system or whether it's an algorithm. And any technology, as far as I'm concerned, is recursive in the sense that you might have an overall technology, a railway system, and then there might be smaller components of it, a railway going from the city to that city. And then within that, you might have other components, railroad depots and freight trains and things like that. So technologies... Uh, a jet engine is not composed of little jet engines. They're composed of little jet engines all the way down. Technology itself is composed of very different things. There's a propulsion system or power plant. There's a fuselage. There's an empennage, which is the tail section and so on. For a jet engine, for a jet uh, aircraft, Nevertheless, you can say those are also technologies. So technologies are made up of technologies all the way down. It's a bit like saying larger Lego constructions are made out of smaller Lego constructions all the way down. Indeed. And I think in your book, you state that the central question of technology is how it evolves. So let's talk about that. How does technology evolve? The reason I'm going into this sort of detail that technologies are built from already existing technologies and they use phenomena is that it, this gives you a story for evolution or a theory of evolution for technology. The theories that have been applied when Darwin came out with his book uh, on the origin of species in 1859 a copy of that arrived in New Zealand, and Samuel Butler, who was an English, really interesting writer and thinker, was in New Zealand. He wanted to get it away from an overbearing father, I believe. He got a hold of Darwin's book and started to wonder in 1863 or so, it took a bit of time for the book to arrive, would there be a theory of evolution for technologies and start to wonder, could steam engines have some theory of evolution or theory of descent? So people started to look at the evolution of technology as Darwinian, but it doesn't work very well. Of course, there are technologies, a railroad locomotive does start simple, 
many variants or builds. You learn what works. And so uh, in the early days, locomotives change quite radically and quite fast. So you could say that's sort of evolution is Darwinian. Small changes are happening. Different designers design differently and the better options are preserved. But if you look at any realistic technology, again, go back to the jet engine, it doesn't come out of, the jet engine doesn't come out of varying air piston engines, as would be the case of a Darwinian approach. It's not, it works on very different principle from air piston engines. Radar in 1936 doesn't come about by saying we're going to vary radio circuits and one day we wake up and say, oh my God, we've got radar. Uh, radar is a different principle. It works on a different principle from either radio receivers or transmitters. It's trying to do something quite different. So I began to realize that there was a big question. Darwin's main question was how do species originate? The question was how do radically new technologies originate? How do they come about? And my answer, and I think for me this is at the heart of the book, is that they originate when I'm compressing a rather new whole story into something fairly short and simple here. But by and large, novel technologies come about when we've got a pressing need. So if there's a pressing need, that I'm saying Britain or in England, aircraft are getting heavier. And they, we can think of things called bombers by about 1930. They're metal clad. They could come over from the continent, possibly Germany, and bomb us. How do we detect them? So at that stage, people had detection devices for aircraft. They're actually pretty good. Huge concrete walls, maybe tens of meters large, shaped parabolically, and it acted really as ear trumpets. And at the end of these shaped parabolic walls, which concentrated any sound of engines coming over the horizon, were people with extraordinarily sensitive hearing. And that was fine, but it didn't work that well. And so there was a need to cook up something that worked better. There was a very strong felt need but in the mid-30s that we needed, or Britain needed to be able to detect aircraft, maybe from 50 miles away or 30 miles away, certainly over the horizon, just for its own defensive purposes. Other countries felt the same. It wasn't just Britain developing this technology. And people realized that very high-frequency radio waves could bounce off things like ships and get distorted or echo back. And if you could point a beam of high-frequency radio waves or anything metal, like a ship or aircraft, if you could do that and detect the echo, you could make that into a pretty good detector for aircraft coming. So then the question is, it's like, how do I get to my office on the Thursday morning when I don't have a car? What pieces and parts should we put together? And so you needed a way to generate very high frequency, highly focused radio waves, and you needed a means to switch them off instantly so that you could hear the echo, some means to pick up the echo that might be some revolving dish. Uh, you needed means to amplify all of this, maybe to show it on the screen. So radar came to be one of several propositions for detecting aircraft. This is fascinating if we think about the purpose and the purpose is what creates the human need and reliance on technology and an evolution, if you will. Something we would love to switch to, which you've written extensively about, is the role 
software plays in economic systems, the impact software has on economic systems. Before we go there, what is the anatomy of economic systems and their relationships with humans? What we've really done in an economy is to get ourselves organized. An economy is basically not a triumph of commerce or a triumph of capitalism or or of socialism or anything else, it's a triumph of organization. But where, as human beings, we've learned to get ourselves organized, somebody down the road here may be producing cabbage. I need to eat. I might want to buy cabbage. Somebody else is doing something else, and we can start to help each other and trade. And that way, over eons, markets have a reasonable and very much what happened was, at least since the Industrial Revolution, we learned to organize things into mills and factories. So with steel mill, you can put iron ore, uh, truck that in, you can bring in charcoal or whatever you're using for carbon. You might need water, you might need certain other metals for alloys. And you bring those in, and somehow in the middle of this factory or mill, you have some form of machinery that's smelting iron or, and then refining it and then turning the iron into steel and then rolling the steel and so on. So there's many operations. What's the role of humans? There doesn't need to be any role of humans, whatever. Logically, if there are some, God forbid, if there are some beings and they needn't be humans if they could carry all this out. This is a touchy subject here. But uh, humans have been very useful because we need people to carry out the various operations. We need people to think up the factories and design them. When the outputs go out the other side, the humans find they can use them. They can use these outputs, be it cement or rolled steel or refined oil, refined into gasoline and that sort of thing. What has changed with, if you want me to talk a bit about the digital economy, what has changed is that I would say in the economy, the 1950s economy, we are transforming usually physical things into other physical things. We're transforming cotton or wool or whatever into cotton textiles or wool products. But really, if you think about it, what we're doing is producing objects that, again, carry out some human purpose. The wool coat may keep us warm and so on. What's been happening in, with digitization, I want to skip quite a few decades forward, maybe until the 1990s or closer to our own day, is that we're finding various things that are useful to us need not be carried out. Everything needs to be carried out physically, but they may not be carried out by bags of cement or tons of textiles coming on the factory door. We might need something like an, an X-ray or an MRI imaging system. What we found is that what we can do many of these things digitally. So if I'm trying to do in the old-fashioned physical economy, I could design an x-ray machine. I could put x-rays through somebody's tissue or brain. And then you have an image on the far side that's carried out via a uh, type of photography. But now we find it very useful to say, okay, I'm going to look at many angles. I will use digitization and algorithms to build up a 3D picture uh, of where things are in the brain to refocus that, to emphasize something, more digital technology to transmit it somewhere. An awful lot of radiology is now transmitted actually to places like probably Bangalore, where there are 
used to be humans looking at this. There might be other algorithms now looking at, at CT or MRI images. And those algorithms digitally are programmed to say, is there some lesion here? Is there some difficulty, some abnormality, some small structure in the brain that doesn't look as if it's healthy? And let me single out that and report it back. So let me summarize that by saying we have a physical economy. I view that as happening above the ground, so to speak. And then, vol, you can take something in to digital space, bump it around, and then shoot it back up. The thought came to me, actually, I think I was in San Jose Airport. It was quite a while ago, maybe 15 years ago. And I wanted to get on a plane, and I took my frequent flyer card. Those days, you, you put it into a little kiosk, your frequent flyer card, and then there's this buzzing other sounds. It would be given back to you in about three or four seconds, and out would come a boarding pass. And I thought, and this is where digitization really comes in. I thought, okay. There's stuff happening on a physical level. I want to get on a physical flight. I need paperwork to do that. I'm standing in front of a machine. I take a piece of plastic, my frequent flyer card, shove it into a physical machine. After that, digital functionalities are working. So it goes down into the digital world. My identity from the card is recognized. Digital transmission to the aircraft or to whatever's keeping track of passengers that have, are checking in. More digital transmission to security people and security devices. Perhaps name recognition. I'm from Northern Ireland, so they might be, hmm, at least in those days, <laughs> quite often I'd be taken aside and questioned. So, what happens in the digital domain is that things are acted upon. I would call that functions. My name is recognized. That's a function or a functionality. Once my name's recognized, it might be sent to security people in London, if that's where I'm heading, to have anything to say about this passenger. It would be sent to what's simulating the aircraft. Where I'm sitting might be balanced and so that you know, we have to let the aircraft move uh, exactly where the passengers are sitting, who's checked in, what's the timing, and so on. So there's a whole world of digital functionalities talking to other digital functionalities, talking to still other ones, switching on this, inhibiting that, switching off things, checking we are not privy to any of that. That's all happening in the virtual system. And then something says, okay, now we have all that issue the card. So I'm, card comes back, I'm back in the physical world. And what struck me was that the major change in technology that's happening at the moment, it became a little fashionable a few years ago for some economists to argue technology is going nowhere. Uh, my refrigerator hasn't changed in 50 years. And cars are not still of four wheels and all this kind of thing. But so nothing really is changing. I think it's changing radically. We have this digital economy or virtual economy where functionalities are in conversation with other functionalities. And that conversation might bounce back and forward. And maybe there's thousands of these little conversations happening. I think if you're in fintech, I call in my identity is clear, maybe from my voice. So I have a voice print that's recognized. So there's a whole digital conversation going on. And that triggers things happening digitally and finally starts to trigger things in the physical world. Yeah, this is quite fascinating. The transition from physical world to digital world and seamlessly getting an output 
into the physical. Taking this further, what kind of economic outcomes are possible now due to software, which probably didn't exist in the 1950s even? Oh, sure. Um, you could say maybe it didn't exist in 2010. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I think what's happening, let me go back to this metaphor or analogy I was making that imagine something for a moment, and that is we're heading towards air traffic control. So actually organizing or managing takeoff and landing of passenger aircraft. And that's increasingly starting to become autonomous. No humans involved. It sounds a bit outrageous, but it's not. And so air traffic control is becoming a digital conversation among many aircraft converging or wherever, Heathrow or San Jose Airport, and talking to each other. There are smart ways of using algorithms to make sure that all of this is safe and well-ordered. But notice what's happening. It's an autonomous conversation among many objects. Now, there may be human supervision in case things go off the rails. Maybe a, another version of pretty much the same thing as to say, very likely in 10 years' time, we will be in digital cars, say, on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles. I think that's the San Diego freeway, I'm not sure. But we will all be in, not all of us, but we may have driverless cars. We drive onto a freeway. Very likely, it will be a special lane, and there will be little convoys of driverless cars, maybe 50 or 100 at a time, going down the freeway. Those cars will not be directed by drivers or driverless. They will not be directed by highway authorities, particularly. They are going to be, each car will be in a digital conversation, sensing where where's the car in front, where or cars behind and to the side and my little area and uh, where the neighboring cars, what are they doing? We'd be sensing and signaling to those cars and automatically taking its place in the convoy. If you need to get off on a, some sort of exit, you will be maybe in one of those convoys and then you can peel off and maybe you'll be joining another convoy. But notice that what before was a one-person physical steering foot on the brakes or on the, on the gas has become an intelligent conversation driven by algorithms, multiple devices autonomously talking to each other. So what's really happening in the economy, and I don't think this is trivial, we're going from humans bringing inputs to the factory system to humans working on those inputs to humans distributing the outputs and using them. We're going into a system where increasingly we as humans have some need. That need is being brought down. We want to get from A to B, either a physical device to do it, or still a car. But the organizing of all of that is being brought into somewhere else. The digital economy or the invisible economy, I'd prefer to call it the autonomous economy, where functionalities detect a car, uh, sense this, accelerate. Those are all functionalities that can be driven digitally, and those functionalities are all talking to each other. It sounds uh, maybe a bit unfamiliar, but that, after all, is how our brains work. I'm not saying it's a perfect analogy, but there's no little smart guy inside my brain saying, say this, say that. You can say, speak for yourself. Our brains are basically different neurons talking to in circuits and inhibiting other circuits and maybe triggering some functionality 
I'm speaking, and then sensing and so on. So this, I think, is an enormous change in the economy. It's not just saying we have inputs and outputs. We've created another economy. In one of the articles I wrote, I call that the second economy. I think I should have called it the autonomous economy, virtual economy. We are learning to take things in the physical world, drop them down into the virtual world. There they get to talk to or in conversation with other functionalities, all represented digitally, all transmitted, and then they pop back up into the physical world. And the humans involved may or may not be conscious of this. I may be a pilot of a plane that's coming in to, to land, and I may not be that conscious except just monitoring, is this all working all right? I may not be in conversation with a human, and likely this will be safer. Yeah, this notion is very interesting. The notion of achieving that purpose more and more, the purposes around different fields of life or different things humans want to pursue will be powered by this digital or virtual mm -hmm. means which you're talking about. And this translation of inputs into these virtual means and the outcomes without the notion of humans even actively knowing how the outcomes are getting realized. Yes, and I think this is an enormous change that we've used human power, if I have an axe or a bow and axe, to satisfy our needs, but we're sending what we need into a different world and then having it carried out in that world. I remember I was wondering abstractly what do canals do? They came along in Holland, obviously, in England, other parts of Europe, and uh, say around the 1600s, they were really going well by about 1800. But what are we doing with canals? If I was mining coal in the north of England, I'd have to get the coal to the coast some way by ox cart, then loaded on the ship and offloaded in the south of England with another ox cart. What, was, what you're doing with canals is you're transferring something. It could be cattle, it could be coal, it could be grain. You're transferring it into canal world. Once it's in canal world, it can be shipped very slowly, but very cheaply anywhere that there's a canal. So we're doing something similar. It's only it's not canal world, it's digital world. And I think this is changing the economy very deeply. I have one other comment. I think something happened 10 or 15 years ago with digital technology and entering the realm here of artificial intelligence. We crossed a barrier about sometime between 10 and 15 years ago. When I was in grad school, basically we were told that computers could carry out anything logical or mathematical. They can do calculations. They can analogy with factories. We thought of them as processing data, shove in numbers or customer names and process all that and do something else will come out. What we thought in those days, I'm talking really about computer scientists and people who thought about computers. We didn't think that they could do things that humans are good at. What we're good at is pattern recognition. I can look at you and recognize your face or I can you might be on the telephone and recognize your voice. That you speak English, I can recognize and parse and understand what you're saying. And we thought computers could never do that. What happened with artificial intelligence or machine learning and algorithmic power is that in a very slow and clumsy way with deep learning and other methods, other algorithmic methods, we taught, as humans, we taught machines to do intelligent association. So I show the cat, and if it's 
properly trained and prepped, it can say, oh yeah, that's a Siamese cat. It's uh, of this sort of species, or I can show the face and say, oh yeah, that's Jeffrey, and here's the address, and so on. So what was a bit of a shocker, I think, to people who thought about computation, not too long after the year 2000, 2005, with the work of Hinton and others, was, oh my God, computation can do association. Up until then, we were very mechanistic and we were saying, can we have a logical system that can take whatever, Mandarin or Cantonese and, or written Chinese and translate that, say to English, and what are the rules and can we program all those rules and get all the grammar? But actually what happened was that all you needed was a large number of ready-made translations, somewhere like Hong Kong, Every speech, uh, every record has to be both in English and in Chinese script. And we can compare the two and start to make associations. I think this was something huge, that not only was there this digital economy where all these functionalities talk to each other, but the functionality started to be ones of making associations. I'm associating these pixels with you, with your name. I'm associating, you call in, you want a mortgage. I'm associating this data, your bank account, many other things with saying yes or no to the mortgage. And so FinTech is built out of things like this. FinTech is built out of conversations, blockchain types of conversations, was built out of uh, associating, doing associations that we thought only humans could do or can do easily. And it's not perfect, it's still early days, but that's where the economy is changing. Everything, not everything, but many things are becoming a digital conversation that we don't see. Those digital conversations are involving associations that we thought only the human brain could make. So there was only shock when all that happened. Another concept we would love to go deeper into, which you've written about, is the concept of increasing returns and its relationship with software. We would love for you to riff on it for a bit. What okay. is increasing returns and how it has impacted the life around us? This is quite a while ago, maybe in the, around about 1979, 1980, I came to Stanford to teach in 1982. And of course, that's next to Silicon Valley. I was extremely interested in what was going on in Silicon Valley. And I began to realize that I was taught that in markets where there were alternatives, you could generate electricity for example, buy hydropower if you were in Norway, or you could buy oil or coal or something. And there were different ways to generate electricity. If you did too much of something, say too much hydroelectric dams, um, you'd run out of good dam sites, and then hydroelectricity would get more expensive. It runs into more difficulties or more expense. There are diminishing returns, you'd say, in economics. If you're an engineer, you'd say there are negative feedbacks. So too much coal getting mined, you run into more scarcity of coal, too many hydroelectric dams. And so there's a balance struck and an equilibrium struck. And I remember asking, even in grad school, I said, what if there were increasing returns? The more of something, the more uh, advantage it gets, the more of something else, uh, a rival, more advantage it gets. Uh, one uh, current example would be something like PayPal. If most of my friends are on PayPal and I'm looking for some payment system, then I want to be able to interact with my friends. So I would go on PayPal. 
if there's some alternative to PayPal, most of my friends are on the alternative, then I have to take that up because it's more convenient if most other people are on that. So there are positive feedbacks. I started to notice in the early 80s that if everybody was using VHS, there were two different systems for a recorded uh, video. One was called Beta or Beta Melts, and the other was called VHS. Beta was supposed to be better, but it turns out that if I want a machine, I have to specify, say, 1982. Do I want a beta one or a beta max, sorry, or a VHS system? It turns out that if many people start to stock VHS, then the outlets that are renting movies to will carry more VHS. So you would want to use a VHS or vice versa. So if something gets ahead, it gets further advantage and the whole situation becomes quite unstable. And I realized that it could lock in. If something got far enough ahead, then it would lock in because that's the convenient thing. Everybody else is using it. And there are increasing returns rather than diminishing returns. So there could be more than one stable solution. And it can exercise a lot of monopoly power. So I started to write this up and I was told that it was theoretically possible that systems that worked like that could lock into something. But that wasn't really important in real life. And then I realized all of technology works that way. If something gets ahead, whether it's computer language or payment system, people will find it advantageous to adopt that. So suddenly things might be balanced, then suddenly swing over. And fairly large technologies or companies uh, can lock in and dominate. I think people in Silicon Valley already knew that, but it was one of these things that they vaguely knew. And when I wrote all this, I couldn't get it published. It was regarded as unfamiliar, but it caught on in Silicon Valley and it became very much noticed. I remember I was told by Sun Microsystems, if I recall, produced Java. I had written an article in and the Harvard Business Review about increasing returns. And Java cost a huge amount to produce. Again, I don't know what the numbers would be, but I would imagine hundreds of millions of R&D cost. And so the whole thing was brought to Scott McNeely. I believe Eric Schmidt told me this. He was CTO of Sun at the time. What should they charge for Java? All the accountants said charge an arm and leg because it's been expensive to produce, we will amortize those costs. And the other faction, I believe this was Eric Schmidt and others said, well, hang on, if we can lock job, we want to get a lot of users up front, so we should pretty well give it away. And then on the back end, we will make a lot of money by charging for it eventually, and maybe charge quite a lot of money. So Eric Schmidt actually took me out to lunch and said, we used your ideas to launch Java. What can we do for you in return? Stupidly, I just asked for a very fancy computer, which they gave me. Anyway, so increasing returns called on, and I would say it's fairly well understood, or extremely well understood these days in Silicon Valley, that if you can launch a product, and it has those network tendencies to get further ahead, think PayPal, then you want to lock in as many users as you can early on. This is a very different outlook in economics. Let's talk just a little bit more specifically about the relationship between increasing returns and software. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Increasing returns are basically if something is more out there in the market for some reason, there are increasing returns of being more out there in the market, more represented in the market, then it has some advantage. Software gets an advantage in two or three different ways. One is that it's extraordinarily expensive to produce. It takes teams of people, maybe a couple of years or more, to get something that's doable. 
But once you have that software language or that application, the next copy of it costs you next to nothing. In the old days, you would just say Windows is on some disk <laughs> and the first disk might cost whatever billion dollars, but the second disk might cost three cents or something like that. So there's big upfront costs and then the average cost goes down as you get more of these things produced. If other people are using whatever that is, it can become a standard. So much like the English language, it pays me to learn the English language if I'm a foreigner simply because there are more people speaking English and becomes a standard. And that can happen very often in software. And it's also the case that if something's tried and true, the more it's out there, the more it's, people learn about it, they notice it, and uh, they adopt it simply because it's, they know it's safe, they know it works. So if I'm looking around for a programming language a few years ago, I might choose Python because I realize that everybody else is using Python. I may not say I'm going to communicate to them via Python and share programs, but I know that's the standard and I know that it works. There's several different mechanisms by which software gets advantage the more it's out there. Absolutely. It's interesting to think about the parallel to English language, like you mentioned earlier, that also has at least some returns that has a network effect. Yeah. I bet you none of your ancestors 500 years ago, or mine, <laughs> spoke English. Mine would have spoken Irish or maybe Norse in the old days. But we're all speaking English simply because we want to fit into a network. So these are now called network effects. I didn't call them that in the first place. I called them increasing returns. Given that we're increasingly no pun intended, operating in a world defined by increasing returns. How would you advise anyone really to think about strategies for how to optimize life in that existence? I would say it's a different world, that the world of increasing returns is quite different. But if you have a world of diminishing returns, typically there might be half a dozen companies making, say, dog food or something like that. And things are in balance. I might have 20% of share if I'm purring dog chow or whatever. I may have 10 or 20% of the market. I can get ahead if I drop my costs, if I'm more efficient, if I have better product and so on. The world of increasing returns operates differently. It's very much saying things are quite unbalanced I need to get advantage early on if I can get a large user base built up rapidly. I may be able to lock in the market. That's indeed what happened to Google. Any rivals have been fairly well shut out of the market. We don't hear much about Yahoo. They may have a small percentage. But usually there's maybe half a dozen different options. I remember when Alta Vista was a pretty good search engine. There are other ones, Ask Jeeves, and then Google and others. But if something starts to take over the market, then it becomes the dominant standard. It's not getting your costs down. It's not uh, making small adjustments, which you would do in the diminishing returns world. Increasing returns world, you're trying to get advantage early on. It's a bit like uh, presidential, the whole presidential primary process that there might be 16 candidates out there. If one of them starts to appear more prominent, they can attract more money, they attract more attention, and that can build up into a bandwagon effect. So basically, it's competing bandwagons. If you don't get enough attention, you don't get much money, and eventually, or maybe quite soon, you have to drop out. And yet, all of that may be due to luck. It's not necessarily that the best person wins. Maybe a fresh lens on this is how to design one's life. Someone who is 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, 
how to think about designing or thinking about life decisions, big life decisions, understanding this environment of increased returns. And it seems to me that the core concept here is getting an early advantage. Any thoughts on that? I'd be hard put to say one thing I'm very aware of, I'm sure everybody is, that there are very small life decisions. There are small differences in things early on. And the more you invest in something, the more you're locked in. I was in secondary school in Ireland, and I was, I think, 15, and I had to decide what what I would... It turned out I was a couple of years younger than everybody, but I had to decide at that age what I was going to be. I decided to be an engineer, but I had no information. I didn't know anyone who had been to university. The local doctor had nobody in my family had been to university. So it's small events can lock in in anybody's life. You're investing more and more and you're in some deeper groove to, and I realized eventually that I wasn't really an engineer. I was extraordinarily interested in technology, but really from a more thinking point of view, and an economic point of view. So I think that small events along the way can make huge differences to our careers. I, a bit later, I was in the University of Michigan and I applied, I wrote to 12 companies for summer jobs and I couldn't, they didn't answer. I wasn't a citizen of the US and this was during the Vietnam War. But I remember telling my professor and I had no hopes for a summer job. And he said, do you speak French or anything? And I said, yeah, French. I'm not very good French. I'm not very good German, but I speak them. And so he put me in touch with a management consulting company. It was, it was McKinsey, actually, and they were opening up in Europe. And that made a huge difference to my career I was brought in. So these small events can magnify. It's a wonderful anecdote. Thanks for sharing. And I think a lot of listeners will appreciate that. And certainly I am in such, and we're we're both grateful that you took the path. There are these paths you take, and as you get deeper and deeper into one path, you invest more and more in that path, and you get better at it. But you might be locked into that. You really wanted to be a vet or a minister of Lutheran. We've been speaking quite a bit about software its impact to economy, its impact to human life. What hasn't changed yet due to software? I'm tempted to start any reply with the word mercifully. (laughs) We still like to hang out with each other in bars or in clubs, mercifully, where we still blunder around us human beings. We like animals. We like dogs. We, by and large, we love other people. Uh, we love our children. So I think mercifully, so far, that's okay. There are many jobs that are being replaced. Not so much that they're being automated away. There's a lot of that. But basically, the landscape keeps changing. I used to think that Say around 1990, I thought, could I ever be replaced by a computer? And I imagined some kind of robot standing in front of my class. Okay, turn to page 203. And then, but that's not the way it's going to work. The way things have changed is that the structure of learning is changing. And what hasn't And I think, so I might be learning a language, not from a human teacher, but actually from a very good feedback system that listens to my attempts at at an accent and gives me a lot of feedback. More particularly, I think that our basic humanism hasn't changed for better or worse. We're still blundering along. But at the end of that technology book, I started to think what is good about technology and not so good. And I had read Martin Heidegger had debated a lot of this in the 1950s of what's technology doing to to us. He had quite a pessimistic point of view. But I came to this conclusion, and I think this might highlight 
what I think about technology. I don't think all technology is wonderful. I'm skeptical about being on the other end of a smartphone all the time. I'm skeptical about getting 30 emails a day and so on everybody else. So what attitude should we have? I was struck that this was a larger question. What attitude might we have as human beings towards technology? Funny enough, it's answered quite well. The modern myths we have tend to be movies. They come out as superhumans and people Marvel comics type of movies. But I got fascinated by the message in Star Wars. And I thought, if Star Wars is a measure of where we are at this stage in our human life, was it for technology or against technology? And I came to this conclusion that the Death Star was, in my opinion, a representation of technology and the people using it clients of that technology were all clones. They were all dressed the same. They were white, meaning they were colorless. They had the same lives. They were answering to this enormously complicated technology. And then I thought, okay, the heroes, whoever they were, Luke Skywalker, Chewie Bacco, the heroes were human beings, but they also had technology. They had these rickety starships, they had rickety machines, the machines worked, sometimes they didn't work. And I remember at one stage, one of the starships broke down and then there's this question, should we get out and push? But what struck me as being very telling was that the humans were not perfect. And in fact, if you went to the edge of the universe to that cantina, most icy cantina, the bar at the end of the universe, the humans were downright weird. Again, Jabba the Hutt and very quasi-human types. But these were recognizable. They had character. They had their own characteristics and their own foibles. They were annoying, but they were all human. And it struck me at the end of Star Wars, Han Solo, Skywalker, that Really, this was a saga of blundering, imperfect humanism versus the perfection of the machine. And the full perfection of the machine meant that we were all colorless and our will had been taken away in service to this huge death star and that we had no real personality and we were indistinguishable from each other as if we were these clones. Then we don't life really at all. So the myths that we are generating today in the movies seem to go in the same direction. Better to be imperfectly human and blunder around and be annoying, <laughs> but be human than to be perfectly mechanical and perfectly mechanistic. And I think that this is something, mentioning this, because I think this is subconsciously haunting us. We're haunted not so much by, we're certainly haunted by automation, we're worrying we'll still have jobs, but we're also haunted by the idea that we are bringing something to life that will not be human. And that's been a consideration from Daedalus Negrus on to Frankenstein's monster, it's not exactly modern, but it's showing up all over the place. All of these movies, they're all showing that either machines want to be human or humans need to stay human, even if that's highly imperfect. And I think that's something that's really in our subconscious at the moment we're worried about. And we ought to be cheerful. I think coming to terms with technology is But we're both using technology and coming to terms with it. It's as if we're not very good drivers and somebody throws the keys to a Ferrari. (laughs) It can only go at 150 miles an hour, but don't worry, it'll get you there. (laughs) So I'll start off 
what motivates you. If you want five second answer, I'd use the word curiosity. <laughs> More than anything, how do things work? Where do things come from? How can we understand that? Which non-consensus views do you hold near and dear? Well, from Newton's time when the Enlightenment, we began to think of the world as ordered and mechanistic. And if we only understood the mechanisms, it would be predictable and so on. And that became a kind of general way of looking at our world and became the basis for how we think about science. And I like to think that the world is unpredictable, that we don't always know what we're doing, that, that the world is organic, that it is always changing. It's forming and changing and evolving all the time. I think that other point of views starting to become more and more central. We're not in an order, equilibrium, fixed, mechanistic, predictable world. We're in a world that's changing. We don't understand it very well. We don't understand ourselves pretty well. And personally, I like that. What or who has had the most impact on your thinking for your life? For the last 30 or 35 years, I have been very deeply interested in ancient Chinese thinking, particularly Taoist or Taoist thinking. And I've delved deeply into that. I'm in science, so I have to be a little bit circumspect. But I think that has directed my life more than anything, is seeing the world as changing, forming, never the same, and adapting and adjusting. Let's just say there's a whole world out there of Chinese philosophy, Chinese thinking, ancient philosophy, and so I find that fascinating. What are you currently reading? Weirdly enough, I'm reading Carl Jung at the moment. I think it's as a balance to all of this, either technology or the economy or digital something. I find it very refreshing to go back and read people who are thinking very deeply about something. So that's one thing I'm thinking. The other is that I've been watching an awful lot of medical soap operas on television. I'm an addict. <laughs> Anyone which is your favorite? No, not really. I, I think I like medical shows. If I didn't do what I was doing, I wouldn't mind having been a paramedic. It's sort of an odd why would that be the case, but I think that to a degree that paramedics are first on the scene, they can make a difference. And occasionally, they're very much needed. My encounters with that in life have been rather few, but it would be the chance to do something very directly use, useful rather than think about something that's indirectly useful. Thank you. Last one. This is such a great conversation. Who are your favorite writers or podcasts? I think that I have been lucky enough to have known some writers in my adult years. I shared an office with Cormac McCarthy as a writer. He wrote All the Pretty Horses, uh, No Country for Old Men. As to podcasters, I'm very taken by the curiosity and depth of Sean Carroll's podcasts. I was lucky enough to be on that a few months ago. There is a Santa Fe Institute series. So I don't listen to that many podcasts, or, or these days I don't read that many books. I'm much more, I will leap onto a theme, such as some martial arts theme, and then get caught up in that, and watch a lot of movies and that, and then move to a different. I'm sure a lot of people are like that. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, Visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at luminaryfm. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with. And thank you for listening.